Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, NPR Morning Edition host and author Steve Inskeep on Lincoln, leadership, and difficult conversations. George McClellan thought Lincoln was an idiot and never changed his mind. I think that's an important insight when we think about our interactions with people who differ today. Mm -hmm. Maybe the goal is not to change someone's fundamental beliefs, but the goal is to get something done. I don't know that moderate would be the word for Lincoln. He was Mm -hmm. not the most radical anti-slavery guy because he believed that political reality and the Constitution limited what he could get away with. But he insisted that slavery was wrong, that the system was wrong. The tragic part of this is that Lincoln surely knew the black laws were wrong, spoke about equality, but did not publicly denounce the black laws. He was focused on slavery. He was focused on this bigger goal. Steve Inskeep, welcome to Chatter. Glad to be here. Thank you. You have done something that no one else I know has done. Um, You have written three books about the mid-19th century that have been immensely interesting and drawn people into a period which often gets lost between the (laughs) Revolutionary Generation and the Civil War. Yeah. Um, What first drew you to that period, and and how have you continued to to complete this trilogy with different characters? Thanks. I think partly it was because I didn't know the story. I grew up with a lot of interest in the Civil War especially, which doesn't make me terribly unique, does Mm -hmm. it? So Mm -hmm. many people are into that history. And I knew a little bit about the revolution in the War of 1812, but very little about what happened in between. It was just a kind of a fog um, to me. I can even remember being a little kid and reading about some reference in a Civil War book to the 1856 election. And it was like, wow, there were there was time, there were elections that that far back. Um, It just seemed so far away when I was a kid. Uh, Then as an adult, when I began writing some history. My first book was about Karachi, Mm -hmm. Pakistan, but did a lot of history of of the India-Pakistan partition, a lot of other things. Um, When I began writing history, I wanted to go back to something that I didn't know, that I I wanted to learn, that didn't feel stereotypical in a way. Uh, And that's why I didn't like dip into World War II, even though I'd been interested in that, or any Mm -hmm. number of topics that are really compelling and that you could write a great book about. But I wanted to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I ranged back uh, to the 19th century first because I became interested in Andrew Jackson, uh, one of the most important presidents really in the country, even though his reputation is considerably diminished today. So we won't say a great president, but a very important president. Um, and I discovered his long conflict with John Ross, this mm-hmm. Cherokee leader, the long prelude to the Trail of Tears. Um and it's one of these stories where we all learn the one-page version of it in school, yeah. or um, one paragraph, or perhaps. one paragraph, or even less. And, and but you know, we we know the phrase at least, "Trail of Tears." Um, but what was the story that led up to it? How did that happen? And I discovered a twenty-year story of the Cherokee Nation's battle through the democratic system, the emerging American democratic system, to hang on to their land, to which, according to a Supreme Court ruling, they were legally entitled. Ultimately, they were defeated and shoved off to the West through an illegitimate treaty uh, and, and a terrible ordeal. But I found something kind of heroic and important in John Ross's long battle to stay where he was. Um, And that has led to these other books, and it's led me back to much more famous ground, I guess. Lincoln is the most written about figure in world history, I think, other than Jesus Christ. That's the common thing that's said. But I felt that I came from a particular perspective for many reasons, one of them being that I'd written these other books about the 19th century and gotten a kind of global idea of what was going on at the time. Sure. One thing that you focus on there is the time period, but something else that stands out from Jackson Land uh, Imperfect Union, the story of the the, the Fremonts that we'll, we'll touch on here as well. And then your new book, Differ We Must, about Lincoln's interactions with those with whom he disagreed. All of them at some level have a story of someone who was at birth and perhaps soon after seemingly ordinary, but through extraordinary times and through extraordinary people in their lives became themselves extraordinary that's not necessarily a theme you went in, it sounds like, yeah. trying to develop, and yet that's become your niche. Oh, well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I hereby claim that niche. I hadn't <laughs> thought about it that way. 
Um, but I think it's true, and maybe it helps me relate to these figures. Not that I'm saying I've become extraordinary or anything like that, but I, I came from Indiana, uh, from the middle of the country, um, and and have tried to make something of myself, and and uh, have ended up writing about these characters that, in some ways, I do identify with. Mm-hmm. Um, Andrew Jackson grew up poor and was orphaned when he was fairly young, and became uh, super rich and powerful and famous. Also became a slave owner, we should note, and exploited people and did all kinds of horrible things, but was a war hero uh, and a kind of hero of American democracy. John Charles Fremont um, was an illegitimate child at a time when this was an absolute mark of shame and came up in the world and made himself famous through this incredible mixture of courage as a Western explorer and sort of war hero and self-promotion. Uh, talented writing that that promoted the American West as a place to settle and also promoted him as the hero of it, along with his wife, Jesse Benton Fremont, who was kind of his press secretary almost, or publicist, or press agent, uh, co-editor, and uh, consigliere. And, and they were fascinating figures. And of course, Lincoln looms over all of this. Mm-hmm. He was a minor character in the other two books, and he's somebody that that you're encouraged to identify with when you grow up in Indiana because he spent most of his youth there. Um, Indiana can't claim to be the state where he was born <laughs> or where he rose to fame, but it is the state where he lived in a frontier area in a log cabin and had to work with an axe to chop down trees from farm fields from the age of about seven and dealt with his mother dying when he was very young and was virtually uneducated, but more or less taught himself to read and taught himself about the world. And above all, as I write in this book about people, he educated himself Mm -hmm. about people. Yeah, I feel it too. I grew up in central Illinois. Okay. And reading through Differ We Must, the many references, and I will say more references than the average book I read, to Bloomington, Illinois, Ah! and of course to Springfield and New Salem and, and others. Uh, it's an absolute joy and, oh, yeah. and seeing That's the great. names of people that have local flavor in central Illinois, like Judge David Davis and Jesse Fell may or may not appear in the book. But it's kind of nice to feel that connection to something that otherwise is distant history. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was fascinating to me, too, to learn about these places. Mm-hmm. And uh, with all of these books, um, I tried very hard to understand the sense of place and I hope yeah. convey it. Um mm-hmm. I mean, the first book is really all about maps. It's about white settlers changing the map of the United States to shove Indian nations aside and create these states that were just notional at the beginning. Um, And I wanted to get that across to people, what that felt like, what the distances felt like, how long it took to travel from one place to another. And then the next book uh, also had, I hope, that sense of place as the world changes and it takes so long to travel across the West, but railroads are spreading and so forth. And we see the culmination of it here in in Differ We Must. And you see what that means for society, not just being able to travel farther and faster, but information moves faster, which is a big Mm -hmm. deal. Absolutely. You already mentioned that there have been a few books written about Lincoln. By, by my <laughs> most recent count, 84 quadrillion books yes, about I Lincoln. I think that's exactly correct. And people have covered just about every angle you would think, everything from Lincoln's ethics to his relationships with uh, Joshua Speed in particular and others to Abraham Lincoln vampire hunter, right? Yeah. And yet you found a new angle. You found the angle of looking at Lincoln through the lens solely of his interactions with, usually conversations, but interactions with those with whom he disagreed or, or who disagreed with, with him. Mm-hmm. What what drew you to that device in the first place? Because it is a new way of looking at this person Thank who has been that. studied so I well. I mean, the main thing was that the vampires were already taken. <laughs> I mean, that would have been awesome. And you didn't want to do werewolf yeah, or no, zombie. No, no. I, I could have been Abraham Lincoln zombie hunter. Mm-hmm. That would have been would have been great. Um, I'm just now, my head is exploding with all kinds of ideas for alternative books. Um, I started out thinking, um, I mean, I, all these books that you mentioned are about the interaction of characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, Jackson Land is not just about Andrew Jackson. It's about Jackson and John Ross. Uh, and they dueled from a distance, but they nonetheless mm-hmm. dueled. Um, and, th- you know, the, the imperfect union is about a marriage. Yeah. about a, an imperfect union of another mm-hmm. kind. Um, and this is about, so I wanted to write about Lincoln's interactions with other people. And I got a notion um, in early 2020, I guess, that maybe I could tell 
Lincoln's whole life story through a series of meetings with different mm -hmm. people. Um, I, I mean, the first one that came to mind, uh, I mean, as somebody who grew up in central Illinois, maybe you grew up hearing this story, I don't know. When Lincoln was a young man, uh, at age 23, living in this little village called New Salem, which is the first place he lived on his own, he was accosted by a group of bullies known as the Clary's Grove Boys, who kind of roughed up, uh, brutalized even any newcomer in town. And the leader, with the poetic name Jack Armstrong, mm -hmm. challenged him to a wrestling match. And Lincoln acquitted himself well enough that he earned their respect. And in fact, they became his friends. And the Clary's Grove Boys ended up supporting him politically, even though they differed. So I thought, wow, that's a great story. Um, in the end, it's barely mentioned in the book. I wrote a whole chapter. I threw it out. I found other other ones more meaningful. But I, you know, gradually pulled together a way to to explore his life through these differences. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, mainly because of events. I mean, it's 2020, it's 2021, 2022. I realized that the story that's relevant is not just the difference and the great diversity of America. Mm -hmm. It was diverse then as it is now. And these characters are reasonably diverse given the time period, I think. And uh, but it was the, it was the difference or rather it was the disagreement. Yeah. It was disagreeing mm -hmm. that is what we're dealing with now. And how do you manage that? And what can you really accomplish by talking with someone on the other side of the table who differs with you? And what I found interesting uh, about it, Steve, is it wasn't that he always went into the conversation not knowing what would happen and a disagreement just happened to come up so often he knew <laughs> that, yeah. that this was going to be an interaction that would be at least politically, um, certainly socially, and in some cases just very viscerally, personally difficult for yeah. him. And yet you can almost see a picture of him just kind of, mm, you know, getting his chin set, swallowing and saying, all right, I've got to do this. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the Fremonts reappear in this book. Uh, John Charles Fremont uh, does something that he was not really authorized to do as a general out in Missouri in the Civil War. And Re Lincoln tells him, modify your order. Fremont wanted an order of emancipation. He wanted to free enslaved people. But Lincoln didn't think it was the right time or that it was Fremont's business to do that. And so he said, modify your order. And rather than just obey, which is, you know, what someone ought to do with their commander in chief, I guess, he sent an emissary back, Jesse Benton Fremont, his wife, all the way back to Washington to argue with the president. And Jesse immediately sends a note over to the White House saying, I'm in town, I'd like to meet with you. And uh, um, according to Jesse's recollection, uh, Lincoln like flips over her card or whatever she sent over and sends a one word reply because she's asked for an appointment time and just writes now. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yeah. great. It's yeah. so great. But it's exactly what you're saying. Like the, he knows this is not good mm -hmm. news that she is in town. He's like, come right over. Let's deal with it. And yet these conversations with, with so much that has been written about Lincoln and uh, so much that has been discussed about his life, many of these conversations were, were private. They were him and someone else, no yeah. note takers present, yeah. which raises the issue of the research and yeah. your confidence in the stories to tell them, often with quotes from, from those who did write letters afterwards and such. Yeah. But talk both about the, the joy of the research for this book and digging mm -hmm. into archives in Illinois and elsewhere. Yeah. And then also the conversations where you really wish you could have captured them, but you weren't confident enough to really write them out as a full chapter. I really appreciate this question. And I especially appreciate it getting from someone from an intelligence background, mm -hmm. because you obviously understand how vital it is to confirm. Sources matter. Yeah, yeah. a lot. They're everything. Um, and for starters, uh, the sources partly or largely determined which meetings which are in this book and which are not, the 16 mm. meetings. Um, there are people that I would love to have represented in this book, and there's not a reliable enough record. Um, Can you give me an example? I'll of one give of you those? an example. I mean, there's a, there's a dressmaker, um, Elizabeth Keckley, who had been freed from slavery. She bought her way out of slavery, which mm. was a thing that people did. They would earn money on the side if they were allowed to, and they would, like, pay off their masters, which is astonishing. Um, but she was a dressmaker. She then moved to Washington after her winning her freedom. She was a dressmaker to Verena Davis, Senator Jefferson Davis's mm. wife. And when the Davises left Washington because Jefferson was going along with the secessionists and going south, Verena says, come on south with us. 
And Elizabeth Keckley says, no, thank you, understanding that her chance of remaining free was less Mm -hmm. the farther south that she went, although slavery was legal in Washington where she was. And she ended up instead being a dressmaker to Mary Todd Lincoln and spending enormous amounts of time around the White House and writing a controversial memoir, a kind of tell-all memoir about her experiences that made Mary Todd Lincoln look very bad. Mm. Uh, And there are a few scenes where Abraham Lincoln appears, but there wasn't quite enough there for me. And in fact, uh, biographers of Mary Todd Lincoln have given reasons that Elizabeth Keckley's recollections of those scenes just aren't too credible. Yeah. Um, and I- even if they were credible, they just don't quite say enough. There's not enough there. So yeah. I had to focus on the, the meetings where I had a source. I've done this with all my books. I've mm-hmm. chosen my characters frequently based on who left a written record of what they thought. Right. And who left a good written record and who went there. Yeah, and so, so in any case, I pick these things out and um, there's only occasionally two complete sides of a meeting. Lincoln didn't leave a lot of recollections, didn't have time to write a memoir, obviously mm-hmm. having been assassinated. Um, but there often are multiple accounts. Mm-hmm. I think of the meeting with Frederick Douglass. If right. you have a minute, I'll just go right. through like what Please. the sources are. So this is the, Frederick Douglass... Um, has been a critic of Abraham Lincoln, but is also supporting the cause broadly. Mm -hmm. In 1863, he's upset because Douglas has been helping to recruit black soldiers for the Union and they're not getting equal pay or other equal treatment, and so he goes to the White House to complain. And Douglas afterward left multiple recollections of this meeting. One is a letter they wrote immediately afterward to this guy who'd hired him as a recruiter. So Mm -hmm. it seems to me to be very credible. Then he discussed it later in speeches and in newspaper articles and added a few more details. And so I think there is a quite credible account of the conversation, at least from one point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, For Lincoln's side, there's not a direct account, but certain things are known uh, about the meeting. For example, uh, Lincoln in the meeting acknowledged that he had been slow to provide equal treatment to black soldiers, Mm -hmm. said it was for political reasons because he was constantly struggling against this tide of racial bias and he did everything that he could as quickly as he could. Uh, And we know that after that meeting, months after that meeting, Congress finally did provide equal pay for black soldiers. So we have a sense of a narrative, a sense of a plot, and we have some sense from Douglas's point of view of how the meeting unfolded, how it went. Um, And then there are other sources having to do with the context. Newspaper stories about what was happening at the time and various other events and various other memoirs and other letters that Douglas sent on other topics. And if you put all that together thoughtfully, I think you can reconstruct um, the meeting. I mean, another one that's a little harder, uh, although I still included it and believe in it, is the Jesse Benton Fremont meeting. Yeah. Again, one side of, one yeah. side of yeah. the conversation, Jesse's, and it's not immediately afterward like that Frederick Douglass example. It's years and years later in a, mm-hmm. in a memoir that she wrote. Um, but what I was able to do there was fact check a little bit of it against a bit of a record of Lincoln's view of this. Lincoln met Jesse Benton Fremont and then walked away but later talked with his secretaries, Mm -hmm. John A. and John Nicolay, about it. And they wrote a gigantic biography of Lincoln in which they quoted his version of events. Mm -hmm. And if you apply those two accounts thoughtfully, with an awareness of the limitations, you can get something of a reconstruction of what happened. And to be fair, you, you are not writing this as an academic historian. You are seeking to use the conversations to make a point about the context, the times, Lincoln's growth, and a story like especially Douglas, but also the the Jesse Fremont story, you you need those stories as yeah. a writer to tell the wider story yes. around it, even if some aspects of the conversation yes. are not perfectly knowable. Yeah, and when you talk about the wider story, a lot of that is documented, and mm-hmm. it's so useful. I mean, I'm thinking about... Um, uh, David S. Reynolds, an amazing historian who wrote a book a couple of years ago called just called Abe. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a kind of cultural history of Lincoln. And frequently he can't prove at all like that Rinca- Lincoln read a particular book or saw a particular play. Right. But 
Reynolds is so incredibly erudite. He knows that stuff was around, that it was in the air, and he recognizes the similarity between a mm -hmm. thing Lincoln said and a thing that somebody wrote. And he uses the whole thing to illuminate Lincoln's period, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's really hard to get into Lincoln's head. Right. Um, I, I will say that there are some vignettes in here that are, I don't want to say predictable, but it would have been hard to write this book without them. Uh -huh. Obviously, Douglas being one of those. Uh, both Douglases, really. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Douglas uh, as well as Frederick Douglas. I think McClellan, Pendleton makes sense. Seward. William Florville mm -hmm. floored me. I, I found that vignette amazing. I'd seen his name in Lincoln books I'd seen before, but I'd not remembered the story. And you don't, you don't have as much of a vivid conversation as much as you have the contrast that this really sets up. Can you can you tell the story of William Florville and, and how you use that to illuminate an aspect of Lincoln? Thank you, yeah. Uh, William Florville, this is one of the hardest ones to write, partly because of the lack of documentary evidence, although there's some. William Florville uh, was an immigrant from Haiti, which had won its independence from France just a few years before mm -hmm. his birth, so his parents would have been enslaved. Um, he was born free, but in a country that was devastated by war and isolated by the international community because um, other nations did not want to recognize this black republic. Mm -hmm. France certainly didn't. The United States was terrified. Multiple presidents just blew off the recognition of this country's independence. Mm -hmm. So he ended up coming to the United States effectively as a Haitian refugee, which uh, I'll just pause for a moment to note, this is the second straight book where I've run into Haitian refugees. I mean, this is a constant flow of, of people from a troubled country that is not, you know, just it's the 2010 earthquake or whatever. This is, you know, no. this is a couple centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and the United States has been intimately connected with the trouble and sometimes mm -hmm. helping to cause the trouble. In and yet, country. as an aside, go back to when you were growing up in Indiana did any history you read Nothing. mention Nothing. this immense influence on Haiti, the revolution, the independence, on early American history? No, no. It's, it's a black spot for so many of us. No, no, not yeah. at all. So Florville yeah. uh, comes from there, goes to Baltimore, then New Orleans, then ends up in uh, Springfield. There's a story that he ran into Lincoln as a young man in New Salem and cut his hair. And I left that out of the book because I'm just not sure I believe that, mm -hmm. but or that I can prove it anyway. And in any case, but what is known, uh, and there is a good documentary record of this or an adequate one, is that he became a barber mm -hmm. in Springfield. He did shaves and haircuts. You could subscribe to his service, which tells me that if you work downtown, you could just like drop by every day, few days, every week, however often, however often you thought you needed to get shaved. He would shave you and cut yeah. your hair when you needed it. And he did that for... Uh, Abraham Lincoln. And it's clear to me from the available record that they were friends, that they knew each other's kids uh, and families, that um, they lived not far from each other because it was a very small city, mm -hmm. um, and that Lincoln did legal work for him even as Florville was cutting his hair. So they're effectively small businessmen in that sense on an equal footing right. performing services for each other but of course legally they're not equal at all mm -hmm. Florville is in a different world entirely because Illinois has these black laws special laws for black people that say they can't vote they can't testify in court they can't serve on a jury they have to file evidence of their free status with the county clerk after a while Illinois even says you have to like file a bond if you're black to even move there after a while, even that is not adequate, and so they ban black people from moving to the state. It's just astonishing. And so Florville's in this different world, but has this intimate connection with Lincoln as a rising politician. He's putting his hands all over his face. Yeah. And uh, there is this story that, uh, I don't know, Carl Sandburg repeats, many people have put into books, um, that, uh, that Lincoln, after the 1860 election, is thinking about growing a beard. This girl has written him a letter, which really happened, encouraging mm -hmm. him to, to grow a beard. And he wrote back saying, why would I do that? People would think it was silly. <laughs> but then he's thinking about it. And after the election, he goes to his barber and he says, Billy, let's give him a chance to grow. That is the story. Mm -hmm. Nothing that Florville said was recorded. Nobody bothered to record that, mm -hmm. um, which annoys me even as I say it. Right. Um, but... I sit there and I think, first, I don't know if Lincoln really said that or not. Somebody said that he said it. But I'm pretty sure that Florville had something to do with a beard. 
because it's a Shenandoah beard, which is not some a term that I ever heard before, but that just means a beard that's down around your chin, yeah. and it's been okay. cut away around the... It's not like yours, David, yeah. where there's yeah. a little bit of mustache and a little bit underneath. Somebody yeah. has very delicately shaved around the mouth. Mm-hmm. And Florville was the man with the razor. So he had something to do <laughs> with sculpting this beard that is possibly the most famous political symbol in American history. Right. He was present at the creation. He helped to create it mm-hmm. um, and did that for Lincoln and with Lincoln, even though they were living in different worlds. Yeah. And I'll add, I guess, the tragic part of this, although I try to understand it, is that Lincoln surely knew the black laws were wrong, spoke about equality before great crowds, but did not publicly denounce right. the black laws. He was focused on slavery. He was focused on this bigger goal, mm-hmm. uh, but did not talk about this disability, in effect, that the law imposed on his neighbor. His political allies sometimes did, and they were crushed because there was so much racism in Illinois. Yeah, and it gets to the larger theme that cuts across so many of these conversations is the picture of Lincoln as... I guess the pejorative term would be a politician. Yeah. But I think the more positive (laughs) phrase of that is somebody who learns to prioritize, knows what his ultimate goal is, and realizes, can't get there yet, so I I need to do X, Y, and Z to get there. And in the act of doing X, Y, and Z, if not compromises some core principles, really challenges some things that he knows are, are wrong. You know, yeah. the fugitive slave law is a famous one. Things that he knows are wrong, but you know what? We're not going to fix it now. Mm-hmm. And we need to build coalitions. We need to get people together for the greater goal. That comes from some of the very early conversations you talk about all the way through to the end. Um, I, I really appreciate you saying that. Now, because I'm an interviewer, I have a question for you if it's, it's okay. Because I, I know that you have interviewed multiple presidents yes. for your past work. Um, do you feel, as you've talked with these presidents and, and gotten whatever insights from them and thought about their careers, that this is a thing that modern, modern presidents pretty commonly face, that they have to make a kind of awful choice? To go into circles within circles, I will soon ask you a similar question. So we'll just keep diving down okay, you great, know, more and more. Uh, my quick answer is no. I think there is a modern tendency, uh, and I contrasted it at the time when, when I was writing my second book and I had a big feature on Henry Clay. I contrasted it with Henry Clay, the great compromiser, yeah. which seems like a good thing when you're trying to keep a union together. In today's day and age, if you're called the great compromiser, a, you're a loser. Yeah. In, like in politics, that means you don't have the guts to fight for what you believe in. And I think that does go across a lot of modern political culture. Hmm. So I'm not sure. I, I never had a, a Bill Clinton or a Jimmy Carter or a George Bush saying to me, you know, no, I compromise my principles for politics all the time. Nobody said that. But there definitely is the idea that you have to have a, a vision, you have to have a firm set of principles, and, and you must follow that or else you're seen as a flip-flopper, Yeah, which is a phrase. I'm curious about the origins of that in political discourse, but I don't remember reading it when reading about Henry Clay. I remember people <laughs> true. valuing that instead of seeing it yes. as a derogatory term. So my question back to you on that is, in your conversations with, uh, such as Donald Trump just last year and others. Barack Obama. Interviewed you know, a few, few of those, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Did you get any insights into whether they were as conscious as Lincoln clearly was about that tension between I am doing something that I know is wrong in the short term, but it's for the best long term. Um, there is a modern example, and it involves a president that I have interviewed, although I didn't talk with him specifically about this. Mm. Um, people uh, will often look at Obama when they think about Lincoln. And Obama encouraged the comparison, by the yep. way, by starting his first campaign at the uh, old state house in Springfield where Lincoln worked. Um, and I think in many ways sort of modeled his thinking and modeled his presidency, uh, not in a really granular way, but in a kind of conceptual way after Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln's always over his shoulder in a way. Um, And people will point to the example of gay marriage, Mm. where uh, Mm. Obama was against it until he was for it. Yeah. Um, And uh, in 2008, it was presumed that you could not be a proponent of gay marriage and get elected and do good things. Mm -hmm. And so he was for civil unions. 
and by 2012, because the ground had been shifting all what those years. What a difference years, a few years made. Uh, it seemed to be something that you could do mm-hmm. and be on the right side of history as well as the right side of immediate public opinion. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to suggest that Obama did that for solely political reasons. He would deny it. Right. In fact, he said at the time, I've just thought very deeply about this. Um, and there's quite possibly some truth to that. I think there are a lot of people who are fine with gay marriage right now who thought it was obviously wrong in 1995 mm-hmm. or 2005. Um, And uh, so people do change their views, but there also was a political aspect of this, of refusing the demands of people that you would now acknowledge to be just. But at a later time, when you could get it done, Mm. you got it done. Mm. And uh, I mean, that's that's a, to me, a meaningful example of what we're talking about. Absolutely. A similar issue that just occurred to me is the willingness, and it seems in some cases the eagerness of Lincoln to talk with people uh, that he knows will be a very difficult conversation. Now, early on in his life, he tended to use the strategy of you tell the whimsical story. So somebody comes in, they say something you don't like, and instead of substantively engaging on something that you know you can't answer appropriately, instead you say, well, that reminds me when I was a boy splitting logs. (laughs) And that to me seems interesting in the modern sense because I don't get that sense as much anymore, that that almost distraction. Yeah. But there are presidents who still put themselves in situations where they have to have a difficult conversation. Occasionally it's politically. But what comes to my mind is visiting the families when a service member has fallen. Yeah. Um, and George W. Bush has written about this where he would you know sit with the family and he would know some of them were very, very opposed to a policy that led to this and they blame me personally And I'm going to get an earful. And instead of telling his staff, hey, try to keep these people away, he would say, that's my responsibility. I wanted this job. Yeah, Uh, That's a different kind of difficult conversation. It's a very different way. But it speaks to the same thing, that sometimes the the position, the the responsibility, the ambition, which Lincoln clearly had to serve in a great public role, demands that you be uncomfortable. Yes, I think that's exactly right. That is a great definition of public service. Uh, And to the extent that we're all citizens, it's a great definition of citizenship as well. I think often of something I read in the diary of James K. Polk, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, president, for those who don't recall, in the 1840s, very important president. Um, And he writes repeatedly in this diary of how he was in the office today, like it's the end of the day, I was in the office today, and there were all these job seekers out in the office and all they want is stuff for themselves. There's horrible people. I hate them. I can't stand these people and I have to meet them. Mm -hmm. And that to me is really powerful because uh, regardless of whether his opinion of these people is correct, he is saying, I'm the most powerful person in this republic and I am beneath these people. They demand my time and it is my obligation to give them some of my time because Mm -hmm. I serve them. Um, That's a really powerful thing. And you see that in Lincoln as well, by the way. I mean, there are occasions early in the Civil War where his secretaries are worried that he's going to like waste all of his time and work himself to death because random people would show up and he would feel obliged to give them time. And some of those were very difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Lincoln did lean into those kinds of encounters and also leaned into uh, encounters with with anybody who wanted to debate him. Right. I mean, we mentioned Stephen Douglas, and you mentioned this is one of the super famous stories. Lincoln looked for those debates, chased Lincoln, uh, stalked him around the state, him around the state. Yeah. anywhere that Douglas spoke. Lincoln would like give a speech the next day, and Douglas is finally like, "Can we just <laughs> talk at the same time?" And then, uh, then, and then, I mean, this went on for years. Yeah. Um, and and in the end, Lincoln did challenge him to to a series of debates, and and in 1858, and. And they did like formal debates, but they'd been sort of debating for years before that. Right. It seems to me that is, and maybe you have a different take on this. Something seems to be lost with the modern protection of the president, if you will. Yeah. You read the stories about the White House being open and people just walking in and out, and of course there there were assassination threats and eventually assassinations linked to people who just were near the president. So I understand the security part of it. But is there something lost by a president who, unlike Polk, never actually has to interact with 
the people yeah. except at a town hall that's arranged oh, yeah. for media. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I mean, you learn, think about how much you learn just going down to the coffee shop sometimes and you overhear a couple of conversations or you ran into somebody you didn't expect to run into. And yeah. uh, you, you can gain a lot from that. And you can gain a lot from what people have to tell you that you don't, that you don't want to, mm-hmm. to hear. Um, and you know, I think a president loses all of that. Mm-hmm. I think again of Obama, who was conscious of Lincoln's example and tried to emulate it. I think he had a thing. I speak from memory here, so mm-hmm. if I'm slightly wrong, I apologize. But my memory is that that his staff would select letters from random people, yeah. and he would personally answer the letters from random mm-hmm. people. So that was as close as he could get to the random people sitting in your ante room waiting for a minute of your time. Right. Um, and and maybe it's as close as you could get in the modern presidency. But I think it's possible that any presidency would be different mm. if the president were able to just go for a walk down Pennsylvania every once in a while. <laughs> there is a not a substitute for that, but a parallel to that, which was not true in Polk's day or Lincoln's day. It's only a modern phenomenon. That actually is the intelligence briefing, is the idea of getting ground truth that you may not want to hear that's that's the purpose of intelligence. Now yeah. it's limited to national security. It's not telling you how people feel about this economic. There should proposal. be an emotional intelligence briefing. Perhaps, oh, there should not. Know. Oh, those <laughs> briefings would get ugly fast. I, I would never be a briefer again at that point. Uh, one story I, I need to, to to let our our listeners hear about is is a wonderful one that you tell. It's one of my favorites in your new book, and it's the. The entire con- there is a conversation there, but the entire story around Lincoln and Lean Bear. Mm. Uh, tell tee this up. Talk about the background to yeah. this and whether this was almost as I think as difficult to to write emotionally as it was to read oh, it. Oh, it's very hard to write. This is a very sad story. Uh, I guess I'm not selling the book very well by saying so. Some people love sad uh, stories. Okay, Steve. well, this is a sad one. This will get you. <laughs> Uh, Lean Bear was a Cheyenne leader, a leader of the Cheyenne Nation in what is now Colorado, Uh, was uh, a man, I believe in his 40s, getting up toward 50, Mm -hmm. and um, was part of a peace delegation or a delegation of Plains tribal leaders invited to the White House to meet with the President of the United States, which was a thing that different presidents had done in different ways over time. Basically, wow the natives by bringing them east and Mm -hmm. seeing how big our cities are and how many people we have and how impressive our army is, so don't mess with us. But this is during the war, and there's a slightly different purpose here, which is don't listen to those Confederates. Well, it's don't listen to those Confederates, (laughs) like because there were some tribes that were drawn in on one side or the other. The Cherokees were split, in fact. Uh, and the, you know they, they didn't want the war to spread out there, and they also didn't want a separate war. Lincoln wanted one big war. He didn't want to focus on Indian wars. Yeah. He'd already had one in Minnesota that was a big distraction and an utter tragedy, which we could also talk about, and uh, he did not want another one in Colorado where white men had discovered gold and were encroaching on mm-hmm. Cheyenne and other tribal lands. Um, and so they brought a bunch of people East to encourage them to be peaceful. Um, And uh, it's a fascinating meeting for which there are actual transcripts of what people said. I mean, not perfect transcripts. In fact, the newspaper accounts are slightly different, but they're pretty good. And so you have a sense of it, but it's part of a tragedy um, because the wrong people have been invited to the meeting. The, uh, the, the Cheyenne leaders who are agreeing to come to something like this are not people who are inclined to war. If they mm. would, they wouldn't be coming. Mm. Um, the people who are inclined to war are the white settlers who aren't in the meeting. Yeah. I, I was struck by the end of this chapter when you write, and I mean, everything is, the, the whole story here, the Sand Creek Massacre, which some people have heard of, um, is, is the tail end of this, but you write, Lincoln needed quiet on the plains so he could focus on the Civil War, but he'd invited the wrong people to the White House. The delegates he asked for peace were not the ones responsible for the war. Yeah. Um, hard hitting, hard hitting. And uh, many of these are, of course. You can't read the, the story about Frederick Douglass and, and his you know, <laughs> bursting at the seams, trying to get Lincoln to do the right thing earlier but eventually coming around to the fact that the president, who was very candid with him in that conversation, yeah. understood the the political picture perhaps better than Douglas did. And you get this sense of respect that comes once they'd had that interaction. A lot of the emotional moments here, 
Uh, did you feel as if, as you were writing it, that you were taken away by by so many of the human tensions that all in, involved these few years yeah. with these crucial decisions? I, I, I totally was. And in the two you mentioned especially so, mm-hmm. the Lean Bear chapter is just really, was mm-hmm. really hard to write and hard to, to, to think about. Um, and I, it's a failure on Lincoln's part. Mm-hmm. This is a meeting that didn't work. He was just delivering the wrong message to the wrong people at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And his one goal was to have peace in the plains and didn't even get that. Mm-hmm. And, and you do feel for the people, for the human beings who are affected. Um, Douglas is an amazing character uh, because he understands pragmatic politics, too. Um, Douglas is an amazing character also because he's playing more than one role. I think about this um, a lot because he's an activist. Mm. And it reminds me of modern activists who've mm-hmm. been in some way effective. They have to play an inside game and an outside game. Yeah. And the outside game for Douglas is saying, Mr. President, you're screwing up. And he means it. It's not an act. It's not a show. He's like, you could free millions of people. You should do it yesterday. Why haven't you done it yet? Mm. And you'll win the war. That's the point. You've got to win the war, mm-hmm. which is what you want to do. It's in your interest to free people. Uh, and Lincoln was not ready for the longest time, and Douglas pu- publicly criticized him. But Douglas also had the inside game of getting involved with military recruiting, engaging with people in the government, supporting the Republican Party, which he didn't agree with entirely, but he knew they had a chance to win and mm. do some good. Um, and you do feel the the pain and the difficulty of that. Um, I've had a chance to do a few interviews uh, about this book, and one of the very first ones was a live TV interview, and there are several people sitting around an MSNBC table, and one of them is Al Sharpton. Mm. And I thought, and I'm not saying Sharpton, Douglas, exact comparison or anything like that, but Sharpton is somebody who also seems to me, I don't know him well, but seems to me has played an inside game and an outside game. Mm-hmm. And we mm-hmm. could go through all yep. kinds of activists on a lot of different issues. Mm-hmm. Um, they face that challenge. And in Douglas's case... Uh, It called on all of his intelligence, Mm -hmm. his sophistication, his understanding of the complex nature of humanity. But it must also have been just an enormous emotional drain to realize, you know, I have to put up with such BS uh, on the way to this thing that is just Mm -hmm. obviously right and should just be done. Yeah, almost inhuman patience, um, knowing what he knew and, and yet not being able to to get Lincoln to where he wanted him to be at the right yeah. time. Uh, so it's a good story in persistence, if yeah. nothing else. Yeah. What about the, the flip side? Um, I know this isn't a, a joint biography of Lincoln and Douglas, but it's the more I read about both of them and their interactions, the more I wonder how much influence did Douglas really have on Lincoln? Because Lincoln was aware of him. He, I think he'd read some of his writings. He certainly knew about the discourse and everything, but it doesn't seem as if Douglas himself moved Lincoln very often through his writings. Oh, well, now that is uh, a great insight and one that I think happens throughout the book. Uh, Lincoln is kind of a stubborn guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, He says himself, in the meeting with Douglas, once I've taken a position, I don't think it can ever be shown that I retreated from it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's true all the way through, and it is true of several of his um, uh, interlocutors in these meetings. I mean, George McClellan thought Lincoln was an idiot and never changed his mind. I mean, Mm -hmm. you could go on and on. Um, And I think that's an important insight when we think about uh, our interactions with people who differ today. Mm -hmm. We get frustrated by the idea of even having these conversations because how am I going to change the mind of this person who's been polluted with fake news and all? Like they're they're, they're just Mm -hmm. lost. They're dead to me. I can't do anything with them because I can't convert them. I can't change their mind, so why am I even trying? And I think maybe we have an unrealistic goal, and it's not a goal that Lincoln necessarily pursued, Mm. um, and that people were not necessarily able to pursue with him. Mm. Maybe the goal is not to change someone's fundamental beliefs, but the goal is to get something done, Mm. to find one thing you already agree on and collaborate on that, or even if you can't do that, to get a little bit of information from the other person about how they see the world so that you can respond in some way Mm -hmm. to that, Um, which is still kind of like a big goal, like takes a lot of work and a lot of effort, um, but does not have in it that moment of revelation where the Mm -hmm. other person suddenly says, 
you know, the scales have fallen from my eyes. I realize you were right about everything. That, <laughs> that just, would be nice, wouldn't it? It would be nice. It just doesn't happen very often. The story that, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the person you chose for this frame, but the frame of Lincoln realizing politically he needed the, what do you call them, nativists at the time yes. to win. He yes. needed the know-nothings yes. types. Uh, and yet you could almost see him just shaking his head in shame, like, I know it's wrong. I know it's wrong. I yes. know it's wrong. Got to do it politically, yes. but I know it's wrong. Yes. Um, Talk a little bit about that, how how Lincoln was able to do things politically, you know, lump in his throat. And in that case, that was a pretty hard one because there's no evidence that Lincoln was a hardcore nativist. And in fact, he abhorred some of the things the, they were saying yeah, the and exact, doing. The exact opposite. Um, he did court, I guess we call them deplorables hmm. now, um, and people who were uh, who had a real problem with foreigners. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I mean, there are there are people today who will insist, I'm not against immigration, I'm against illegal immigration and so forth. Mm -hmm. These are people who are like, foreigners are bad. Yes. Native-born people are good. Foreign-born people are bad. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of nuance. There. No, no, there's not a lot of nuance. And it's like for the most terrible reasons, like they're, they tend to be Catholics. The Catholics are, are being used as pawns by the Pope to take over America. I mean, the wildest conspiracy theories. Um, and, and, you know, we have to, we have to, to form secret societies against foreigners. We have to take vows that we will keep them out of government and we will propose all these laws to keep them from voting. I mean, it's just really, really, um, really extreme. Um, and uh, Lincoln was surrounded by these people. A lot of his old political and personal friends, according That's to right. him, were know-nothings, mm -hmm. embraced this movement in the 1850s, which grew very, very large and very, very powerful. And Lincoln, in one of the most famous... Surely, maybe the most famous Senate race in American history in 1858, mm -hmm. when he ran against Stephen Douglas. Um, according, and this is clear from the documents, clear from his own notes. He he had in his possession uh, this newspaper article that showed like the voting totals from the previous election in all the counties of Illinois, and he knew something about these counties, and he understood that he really needed to win these counties where no nothings were strong. Mm -hmm. And he's an anti-slavery guy. He wants to do something about slavery. He's a big rival of Stephen Douglas. He wants to finally beat Stephen Douglas, and he ain't going to do anything unless he gets some know-nothings to vote for him. And so he goes to his friend, Joseph Gillespie, yeah. who he's known for 20 years uh, and who drives Lincoln crazy with his anti-immigrant rants <laughs> and says, I need your help. Uh, you happen to be running for re-election too, by the way. I need you to vote. I need you to campaign for you. I need you to campaign for me. I need you to get a lot of... The American Party, that's what they came to call themselves, yeah. the Americans. I need you to get lots of Americans on our side. Um, and it's going to be really hard, but you got to do it. And Lincoln even ended up supporting a kind of unity convention between his Republican Party and the know-nothings to try mm -hmm. to get on the same page. Um, and this had to have been excruciating for him. It was also extraordinarily politically excruciating because immigrants were part of his coalition. He wanted German immigrants to vote for him, and he wanted know-nothings to vote for him. <laughs> he did try, and I think more than tried. I mean, you know, we don't have a record of every word that he said. But according to the record of every word that he is known to have said, he never embraced their cause at all. Yeah. He would go before them and talk about slavery the thing where he hoped they had the same view and he would be silent on all the other stuff, mm -hmm. um, which must have been hard, um, but he did it. He stood up on stage at least twice with his friend Joseph Gillespie, mm -hmm. who I'm sure did whatever Joseph, Joseph Gillespie had to say, you know, and mm -hmm. everybody knew what Joseph Gillespie stood for. Um, and there's a fragmentary record of a meeting that I try to reconstruct where Joseph Gillespie tries to persuade Lincoln to talk differently, to tell more anecdotes, to have more That's fun right. with these crowds. Yeah. And uh, there is some evidence that suggests to me that Gillespie also wanted him to rant about immigrants just a little bit. And Lincoln wouldn't do it, found it unbearable and told mm -hmm. Gillespie so. Yeah. Um, and so Lincoln, by his fingernails you know, on the wall, basically uh, held on to his principles but reached out for every vote that he could get for what he believed was a moral and right cause. It really points back to that large theme here of the prioritization, yes. which can seem, I don't know, unseemly. Uh, it can seem very uncomfortable to have to prioritize things in that way. But given the times and given what was to come afterward, 
kind of hard to knock it because the prioritization did ultimately work. Yes. Yes. In the long term, uh, Lincoln lost that election, by the way, won the popular vote because it was a vote for state legislature who would choose the yeah. senator. Won yeah. the popular vote, but the way it worked out, he didn't quite have control of the Senate. So he lost. Mm -hmm. But they added some know-nothings to the party, which other Republicans were doing elsewhere. And know-nothings were part of the Republican coalition that won in 1860. Yeah. So, uh, like, I guess we have some uh, anti-immigrant hotheads mm. to thank for helping to end slavery, for playing their own yeah, small right. role in it, which is just kind of wild to contemplate. It seems like that trait of Lincoln would put him in the modern context, certainly out of sorts with, with some major party uh, dynamics. Would he be in the Problem Solvers Caucus? Is that oh! kind of where he is, that he'd want to be, if not the one brokering the compromises, being the one who was willing to go along with oh, some of the compromises? Yeah, I, I suppose he might be in the Problem Solvers Caucus. Hmm. Um, I feel a need to define our terms here a little bit because people talk about moderates, <laughs> mm. uh, and, and, no moderate. and we kind of think, well, what is it? Are you, are you, he's a moderate extremist. Uh, what is that? Um, <laughs> like, what are you moderate about? You right. know, and yeah. we have a tendency to kind of despise the idea of moderates. I mean, Republicans yeah. are like moderate. What's that yeah. for? Like, like they won't even admit to being a moderate because that would be the end of their career. And on the Democratic side, it's like, why are you moderate about my civil rights? Why are you? Yeah. How, what's to be moderate? it about. Um, and I think those are all fair complaints. So what does it mean even to be uh, a moderate? Um, I think about someone like, you know, Mitt Romney. Is Mitt Romney a moderate? It seems to me he is a conservative mm. with very strong views on a lot of different issues who also believes in the Constitution pretty strongly. And mm. so that's really not moderate. In any case, um, mm. I don't know that moderate would be the word for Lincoln. He was mm -hmm. not the most radical anti-slavery guy because he believed that political reality and the Constitution limited what he could get away with. Right. Um, but he was as radical as he could be. And he had a radical belief mm -hmm. that he said out loud that ultimately made it impossible for him to compromise with slave owners. We should remember this is the guy who ended up presiding over a civil war, mm -hmm. uh, leading the winning side in the civil war. Uh, he insisted that although he did not demand immediate abolition because it seemed impossible to him, that slavery was wrong, that the system was wrong. Um, he was unyielding on that. He was not moderate about that. He didn't say, I wish there was a little less slavery. Yeah. It's, you know, and there were actually people who, I mean, there's a character uh, in the book who thought that slavery was kind of bad and he would like reform. Right. Slave reform. Just improve it a bit on the yeah, edges. Exactly. Can yeah. we can we figure out a way that we're not like like uh, borrowing yeah. money against? It's kind of missing the slaves. point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like like you're not going to fix this system. It needs to be destroyed. So Lincoln was kind of not. Uh, I'll lose the kind of. I'll strike the words kind of. Lincoln was not moderate in his yeah. beliefs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, about slavery, but he was pragmatic. And I suppose in that sense, he might be part of the Problem Solvers Caucus, or if he wasn't, he would certainly talk to everybody in the Problem Solvers Caucus. I think pragmatism is is the right concept. But even that, you know, over times, decades, centuries, it, it changes. The one thing that seems similar from those times, I'm curious about your take on this, Lincoln playing with the nativists in order to get this literally brand new Republican Party off yeah. the ground and to be a vehicle against the, the greater evil he sees. Uh, people are not, I think, yet predicting a breakdown in the party structure we've had for a while, but there are some parallels to the 1850s going into 1860 now with you know, different wings of the party taking, taking on each other, perhaps more so than the other party. Um, no one yet has predicted the new Whigs will take over in the next presidential election. No. But do we have a position for somebody who, perhaps like Lincoln, says there's a cause greater than ourselves here. Uh, let's work across what exists now as these party lines and, in a sense, reform the political landscape. Or are things just too ossified? Yeah, I'm thinking about that. Like, what would be the... What would be the issue on yeah. which you would break off from either party successfully mm. and start a new party? I mean, I guess you could say, like, I'm a Republican, but not a Trump person, and so I want to start my own party. Mm -hmm. But uh, it wouldn't have a lot of voters right now. Uh, right. I mean, And even if it's constitutionalism, the, the issue is, well, guess what? Some of the you know, Trump supporters um, believe they are the ones defending sure. the true Constitution. Absolutely. So that might not be the hook that everyone thinks it is. No, no. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, you know, the Republican brand is toxic to people who are not Republicans. And I'm just stating a right. fact that you could poll on. Um, 
and people who are Republicans who still embrace that brand, the vast majority of them support Donald Trump. So how do you get a mm. get another party um, get another party out of that? Uh, I mean, the Republican Party it had many roots. But in the end, what the biggest part of it was, was the old Whig party. There was an old party that had kind of imploded, mm -hmm. but still had like the political structures and the politicians and the various leaders and the mm -hmm. institutional knowledge. And just a whole lot of them became Republicans. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, the, the first thing you'd have to have is an outright collapse of one of the parties or the other. Um, yeah. The Democrats are not about to collapse because they have the presidency and that tends to hold a party together. The Republicans have... Not the presidency, mm -hmm. but they have this um, media infrastructure yep. mm -hmm. that pushes all in one way. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you and I are talking. I don't know when this podcast is going to go out. So what we're about sometime to say, in the next seven years. I'm next confident seven of years. that. That's good. So <laughs> some of what we're saying may be dated, but on the very day that we are talking That's here, right. uh, Republicans are getting ready for an election for Speaker of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And there was a divide among Republicans, which is why they fired the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And the vast majority of the people wanted to keep the guy they had, Kevin McCarthy. Mm -hmm. um, and yet they weren't able to do it. And then there was going to be uh, uh, Steve Scalise, who was kind of his deputy, to be the mainstream replacement. And they were all for the mainstream replacement, except they were only mostly for the mainstream <laughs> replacement. And then all of a sudden, this more extreme guy that they said they would never accept ended up being the only nominee. And in the hours before you and I began this mm. uh, uh, conversation, more and more Republicans who said they'd never be for Jim Jordan were for Jim Jordan. Mm. Now, again, this may turn into a totally different fiasco by the time this podcast goes out. Right. But what that is is a demonstration of a party dynamic that just you know unity is more important than anything else mm -hmm. for a lot of mainstream Republicans. There seem to be a lot of guys on the extreme who because of the districts they represent mm. or the money they can raise or the media profile that they have can defy leaders mm -hmm. as Matt Gates did mm -hmm. to kick this whole thing off and do not apparently pay a price for it. So you can have disloyalty in one direction, mm -hmm. but you can't have it in the other. And that dynamic holds that party together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just thinking this problem through. I mean, the Republicans are the ones who have repeatedly underperformed in national elections. They very reasonably expected that 2016 was their turn, and they won, but with less than a majority of the popular vote. They uh, had a very bad midterm in 2018, although not as bad as perhaps they would have feared. They lost a presidential election in 2020. I'll just repeat that. They lost mm -hmm. the presidential election in 2020, according to dozens of courts and thousands of election officials in both parties. Um, and they underperformed in 2022. So uh, if that party were being responsive to electoral signals, they might say we're just not like quite broad enough here and we've lost a lot of voters in suburbs that were Republican suburbs 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and we need to do something about that. Hmm. Uh, but they're not moving in that direction. The direction they're moving is we can grow the uh, voter base that we already yeah, have. Double down on With where more we are. people like we've already gotten. And mm. in fairness, there are more people out there. There are more people to find. Mm -hmm. Every election has a different set of people. But I guess in answer to your question is I do not see the thing that would crack apart a party yet yeah. that would lead to something else, even though the no labels people are out there working on it. You know, it's interesting to hear you talk through that because so many of those dynamics you described up to the point of they're still doubling down on their base and they, they have the media infrastructure kind of sounds like you're describing the Whig party in the 1850s, which is losing election, losing election, losing election. Yeah. Uh, some fundamental tensions within the party, splitting them apart. And I'm betting, and I haven't thankfully read, you know, diaries of every member of the Whig party in the 1840s going into the 1850s. But from a monumental history of those times, I don't recall, I don't recall that they at the time knew what we know now, which is, hey, you're imploding and there's going to be a new party born. They didn't get that. They thought they were still holding on perhaps just held together by the legacy of hating Andrew Jackson. That has a long lag effect. Yeah. But they did not know that their party was literally ending within a few years and would be seen as a, a, a footnote in a short version of American political history. And that's kind of how the first part of what you said sounds now is those same dynamics. Now, of course, there was a bigger issue ripping them apart, the yeah. sectional dynamic and the, the fundamental uh, incompatibility of the Whig party when it came to slavery. But 
some of those dynamics are the same. And it yeah. makes me wonder if historians looking back 50 years will say, wow, you know, those people in 2020, 2023, 2025 were sounding a lot like Whigs in 1850, 1855. Yeah, I don't know. But the one part where I would agree is we don't know what's coming. Yeah. And uh, it'll all seem obvious in retrospect. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, we like to close our conversations here on Chatter by reaching into our vaunted Chatter box okay. and finding a random question for it's you. It's a lovely box, by the so, way. So thank you. Very I stylish. believe... I believe this one is from Mauritania. Really? I believe my wife obtained that there wow, on a trip. The, like and, a uh, metal top that's got kind of stamped metal or engraved in some way. It, it certainly looks nice, and it's done well for us so far with our, uh, with our questions. Okay. So, if you could give one piece of advice to your 20-year-old self, what would it be? Oh, wow. I have things. But you said <laughs> one. Um, study more languages, oh. and be more aware of the wider world. Um, and, and those two do seem related. Yeah, it's kind of, it's a double, but it's a single. They are related. Um, when I was in high school, the only language I took was Latin. Mm. Surprisingly little spoken in the world today. And uh, when I went to college, I was an honor student, which allowed me to ignore the requirements. And so I got away without taking a language in college at all. Yeah. And I spent my whole adult life catching up on that, hmm. teaching myself essentially, taking classes, enough Spanish to like not actually die in, hmm. in a few South American countries and, and studying Arabic very badly and studying a little bit of Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, even the little bits that I've learned have opened doors and helped me understand cultural things about places and helped me understand conversations and occasionally do an interview in various languages. Mm -hmm. um, and... I think it is a metaphor for understanding the, the, the wider world. I mean, you know, I want to understand everything. Uh, I want to go everywhere, see everything, mm -hmm, hear mm -hmm. everything, understand everything. Uh, and different languages are uh, a pathway to that. And maybe it is not um, the uh, totally ironic that my 18-year-old self, not literally, but my daughter, um, ended up going to a school where she got 12 years of English and Spanish. Huh. And has added like six years of Chinese to that and is off in college studying languages. Mm -hmm. So uh, she took the advice that I wish I could give myself. And maybe 30 years from now, she's going to be wish I'd given her some different advice. I have no idea. But uh, <laughs> she, in any case. She, she will have wished she read more uh, 19th century American history. That's probably it, Perhaps. Yeah. No, um, she told me actually that it'd be better if I wrote fiction. Then more people would be interested in my books. My son has told me the same thing. <laughs> Except he puts it more bluntly. He said, uh, Dad, when are you going to write a good book? Oh, I know. that hurts. And that I keep hurts. thinking he'll grow out of it and realize what he said is not kind. No, he, he doubles down every time he thinks of it. Um, let me f close by following up on your, your, your language point. Have you been, you, you've done so many memorable interviews. Have you had an interview with someone where you had to conduct it through translation, where you really wish you would have had the language in order to capture the nuance and in order to perhaps use that as a tool for a sharper oh, experience? Oh, yes, yeah, so many times, so many times. Uh, and I can think of like high profile ones, like, I don't mm -hmm. know, presidents of Iran. Mm -hmm. um, but... I will tell you instead uh, the story of just being in Afghanistan yeah. after 2001, like November, December 2001, January, mm -hmm. February 2002, and going around and talking with people. Um, and I'm in a culture that uh, is polite, mm -hmm. where people are inclined to tell you what they think you want to hear. And, uh, and, and I'm not making some kind of broad generalization. I'm just talking about you know, the culture as it presents itself as well. And uh, doing this through translation in a country where people have multiple languages. Yeah. So, uh, and, and I do feel like sometimes in places where you, you, you need to learn three or four languages to get along, like, like does everybody really have a total clarity in, mm. in, the, in the depth and meaning of each, each language? But in any case, um, I would have this experience uh, with a, a, an interpreter that I'm still in touch with in Kandahar, Afghanistan, young man who's been an English teacher and was now going around and interpreting for me. Mm -hmm. And um, and I would ask a question, and um, the interpreter would take a long time to, in, to, to yeah. interpret it, and then the answer would come back, and the answer might also be very long, and then he would finally turn to me, and he would say, yes, oh. and, or, or whatever, and, or give an answer, and then yeah. I would just think, um, 
I'm missing something. And so I would do this thing where I, and I do this in in single language interviews as well. I will repeat back what you told me because I want to make sure that I understood it. And sometimes that drives people further into an explanation. And sometimes they say you're just wrong and they explain it. Mm -hmm. So the answer comes back and let's say hypothetically the answer is yes. So I repeat back what I understand that yes to mean. And then it goes back through the interpreter and comes back again. And this time the answer is no. You know, it, whatever it was the first time, it is the opposite the second time. And now I don't know, was he telling me what I wanted to hear the first right. time? Right. Was he telling me what I wanted to hear the second time? Um, and so I have to go around a third time. But mm. I guess maybe if there's any moral any lesson is that it does apply even in a solely English language conversation. It is so worth putting it in your own words to try to say it back to the person, to try to make sure that you understood what the heck they said. Mm. I've been in so many conversations, and maybe you have too, where uh, you realize that the other person was listening but not really listening. Mm -hmm. They just didn't quite even, and it's not that they were ignoring you, they just didn't quite catch the syntax of what you meant. Yeah. Um, and it's great uh, to just kind of repeat everything, which is why we're going to do this conversation for another hour. You is know what? Right? In fact, uh, listeners, when you hear this, probably in about a week when we post it, um, this will be the best of the five consecutive recordings we did of the same conversation. Uh, Steve, um, I want to congratulate you on the publication of Differ We Must, How Lincoln Succeeded in a Divided America. Uh, hopefully not the last of your books about 19th century America to bring Thank it alive you. for a generation that largely does not know it, even from history books. Um, and appreciate your insights today. Thank you. It's been great. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.